It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. It is the Thursday, August 18th edition of the show, and it is absolutely loaded today. A lot to discuss in the world of college football. Of course, the Big Ten media rights deal was announced. Uh, UCLA and the Big Ten uh, maybe was announced a bit early. And we're going to get into all of that, the new Florida football facilities, what's up with Notre Dame, uh, a report about the 16 biggest college football fan bases in the country, and much more, much more to dive into. I've got it all on lock, ready to go. Hopefully you are too. I'm not going to waste your time too much, but I am going to go ahead and tell you the Bet U.S. College Football Show is rolling. We had our first Futures show, our only Futures show. You can go find that in the description down below, or if you're listening, it is in the description on the podcast as well, but you can find it at the Bet U.S. College Football Picks and Predictions show on YouTube. Easy to subscribe to. Go and check it out. Myself, Parker, and Kyle, I think that we do a fantastic job. Now, you can tell us otherwise. You let us know. Jump into the comments over there, but subscribe to that channel. If you're not already subscribed right here, what are you doing? If you're listening to the podcast or if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and make sure that you are subscribed and that you like the video for me, please. Again, this is a one-man operation. We do have a lot of big things going on in the background, a lot of big things in the works. Some of them I will be able to announce next week, but we'll we'll get there when we get there for sure. But yes, subscribe, like, jump in the comments. I want to hear your thoughts on these opinions for sure, or give me your opinions on these thoughts. How's that? One way or the other. But a lot of news to get to today, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, oh, for those of you that would like to follow on Twitter, you can do that, at GaryWCE, if you do not already. The show is at Winning Cures, but most everything that you find over there, you can get on my page, at GaryWCE. Now, diving into the news of the day. The Big Ten media rights deal was announced on Thursday morning, and it was massive. Absolutely massive. $7.5 billion over seven years, and this is per the Wall Street Journal. They've got a relationship with Fox, so I think that those numbers are the most accurate. But from everything that you've been able to read, it's between seven and eight. So we'll just go with $7.5 billion right there. That is a lot of money. And it begins next year, the 2023 college football season. You will see things change. We'll go ahead and bring it up on the screen here, but... The agreement, of course, includes the Big Ten Network, CBS, Fox Sports, FS1, NBC Sports, and the Peacock streaming service. Now, what it does not include on that graphic there is there will be some games on Paramount. So, we'll we'll get into all of that. Uh, the details here, really, uh, just a ton of wordage and everything else. It goes into the agreements grant uh, for all of the different partners, which is Big Ten Network, CBS, uh, it does say Big Ten football and basketball broadcasts will also be streamed on Paramount Plus, which is Paramount Global's direct-to-consumer streaming service. Uh, starting in 2024, CBS will televise up to 15 regular season football games per season, including an annual Black Friday game in the afternoon. Now, that takes the place of Missouri and Arkansas, which has been the Friday uh, SEC game for quite some time. Now, Another interesting part of this is CBS's initial season in 2023 will include seven football games and both regular season and postseason men's basketball action. Now, they've had the Big Ten Tournament championship for quite some time, right? CBS still has their deal with the SEC in 2023. This is going to be interesting because it is they are contra- uh, contractually obligated to air the SEC game in that 3.30 p.m. Eastern time window. And that's also the time window when they are supposed to be airing the Big Ten second-tier game, whatever that may be. I'm really curious how they're going to get around this, or is there some kind of a deal that has been done in the background to where ESPN or ABC, whatever, the parent company in Disney, are they going to buy the rights a year early? Now, that's something we've been talking about for quite some time. I'm curious to see if this won't automatically begin next season. Uh, But maybe they'll just buy the rights for some of the games 
for 2023. We shall see. Maybe that's how they get around it with only seven football games next year. Uh, Fox, of course, has their big agreement, uh, 10 to 14 games involving a Big Ten team, uh, et cetera, for main Fox, big Fox, whatever you want to call it. Of course, a ton of games on FS1, et cetera. Uh, Going to be huge for Fox because they own the Big Ten Network as well. So it's it's definitely big. NBC, it says, will produce 14 to 16 games on broadcast television each season as it introduces college football fans to Big Ten Saturday night. So it's not college football night in America. It is Big Ten Saturday night. So that is interesting. Uh, each Big Ten game on NBC will be broadcast or simul-streamed to Peacock, which is NBC Universal's direct-to-consumer streaming service. Uh, this is, this is going to be interesting because it says for Peacock, uh, they will deliver exclusive Big Ten football and basketball games each season. Notice that word, exclusive. Eight regular season football games will appear on the platform, along with as many as 47 regular season men's basketball games. That's 32 games in conference and 15 non-conference matchups, along with 30 regular season women's basketball games, 20 conference and 10 non-conference. Uh, it says CBS, Fox, and NBC will combine efforts to televise the seven Big Ten football championship games during that term. Now, this is big because Fox has had the Big Ten championship game for a long time, and it has produced incredible ratings results for them. So I'm surprised that they were willing to give up some of this, but that is a huge property that they might could get away with giving away for a year or two. And what they do in this, out of the seven years, Fox is doing it four times, CBS twice, and NBC once. CBS has it in 2024 and 2028. Fox has it in 2023, which is next season. 2025, 2027, and 2029, so basically every other year, and NBC will have it in 2026. Uh, this is, I mean, this is massive. Um, just a huge, huge deal. Now, this does lead us to some questions here, because according to the Action Network, and I'll go on and bring that up here, uh, there are, there's an escalator clause in this. Now, if you look at it, uh, it says Big Ten Land's historic media rights deal, and then it says more expansion ahead. Now, I had been told by a couple of people that that might be interested or, or invested in this, I'll say that, that the Big Ten is looking to expand, and they are at not only looking at the Pac-12, but also at the Big 12. Now, I don't know anything specific other than that, but they are... They are really looking for more expansion. They are looking to go as an all-American conference. Just all over this entire country, they want to have a footprint in some of the biggest areas. So, uh, the contract has an escalator clause, meaning the deal could approach nearly $10 billion if the Big Ten's membership increases, network sources said. Even after adding USC and UCLA, the Big Ten is, quote, not done expanding, sources told the Action Network. Now, uh, it goes into they were targeting Notre Dame, uh, along with that Oregon, Washington, Stanford, and Cal, which is something that CBS put out not that long ago. Uh, but there are some other things involved in this, and that escalator clause is a big, big deal, right? Because you can go back to the renegotiating table and it still be part of that contract that is kept together, right? Uh, you don't have to necessarily go back with the exact same people, but now you do because it is automatically put into this contract. Uh, the contract is backloaded for USC and UCLA to join in 2024. So next year, they will make nearly $60 million uh, per school, which is about the same distribution that they have been making. So they'll continue to make that in 2022, 2023, and then in 2023, 2024, and it will continue to grow slightly after that, and it's going to be majorly backloaded on the back end. Uh, it's going to grow to about $100 million per school, including revenue from the CFP, bowl games, and the NCAA basketball tournament. So it's not just this money that they're getting. They're also going to be getting their share of whatever the next stuff is, the next CFP contract, right, the next playoff contract, uh, along with bowl games, of course. Each team, each conference makes a bit off of that. And the NCAA basketball tournament, however many teams you get in, you get a cut of those certain units, right? And so this is... Again, I can't state how big this is. Having a 12 p.m., a 3.30 p.m., and a 7 p.m. game on three major national networks, it's, it's going to expand the reach of the conference, for sure. We saw what the CBS deal did for 
the SEC. Now, throw in the fact that the SEC never had a game on ABC, really, uh, at least over the past 20 years. But you've got that one main ABC spot for the SEC, but now you've got all three of the other major networks that will be broadcasting Big Ten games. This is big for the conference. Very, very big. I'm, uh, I'm curious to see what's going to happen. I am curious to see what's going to happen, for sure. Moving on, did we really think that it was going to be that easy for UCLA to just pack up and leave California for the Big Ten? Now, USC is a private institution. Obviously, that makes sense. They can do whatever they want to. However, UCLA is part of the UC system out in California. And it was not just a surprise to the rest of the country. The surprise of UCLA moving to the Big Ten was also a surprise for the UC Board of Regents. They had no idea that this was even happening. So, of course, there's been a lot of back and forth. Everybody remembers the governor, Gavin Newsom. He's a board member, of course. He's, uh, he, he talked a lot, I will say that. And yet, didn't even show up for yesterday's meetings. But regardless, we'll uh, we'll dive into this. This is over at the Mercury News, and uh, let's see, John Wilner, of course, Mister Mister Know Everything about the Pac-12. He and John Canzano are great. Their new podcast, by the way, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. The article says Pac-12 survival. UC Board of Regents examines details of UCLA's pending departure indicates move could be overturned. Now, it says the open session at UCLA suggested the regents have unanswered questions. And there is a lot to to dive into on this. Um, it says, from UC Pre- uh, System President Michael Drake describing the impact report as an interim document to Regent John A. Perez noting that the meeting was, quote, a really good start to the conversation The governing body of the UC indicated it plans a deep dive into all aspects of UCLA's move, including its impact on Cal. There are a lot of questions here. What I'm I'm interested in is, one, are they going to allow UCLA to complete this move over to the Big Ten? If it doesn't happen, what happens to this Big Ten contract? Does it change anything, right? Was UCLA just an additional partner for USC or... Do they, do they maybe take some of that money back? I'm really curious what's going to happen here, but this is this is interesting on a lot of different levels, right? Uh, the financial impact on Cal Berkeley, right? The Cal Golden Bears, the impact of the Pac-12 basically disintegrating is going to be huge. I, I don't think that Cal is going to make that much money. The initial Initial reports that came out, I think Jason Shear over at Wildcat Authority uh, said over on 365 Sports that the initial offer from ESPN was $24.5 million annually per school. That's not great. But it's also not a ton less than what they were already making anyway. And so we'll see what the, now that we've got the Big Ten rights, we'll see what the Pac-12 rights bring in, etc. And that's going to be a big point of contention for this move being made. Uh as you dive deeper into this article, it says um, it says the Bruins' exit from the Pac-12 announced June 30th was surprising in many regards, including the manner by which UCLA was able to dodge bureau- uh, bureaucratic potholes and leave behind its sister campus in Berkeley. In response to an inquiry from the hotline, a spokesperson from the UC Office of the President explained at the time that there was no requirement for a decision from the University of California Board of Regents or the Office of the President. It says, uh, in other words, UCLA Chancellor Gene Block had the authority to act on his own. Now, it appears that that's not the case, based on a bunch of the comments. And I will tell you this. If you go back and read through and watch some of this, it is quite obvious that the majority of people that were involved in this have no idea about anything related to college athletics whatsoever. They've got no idea. However the points that they make are still good points, right? It it did seem strange to me and to everybody else, I think, that UCLA could just pick up and leave when they are part of the bigger UC system, right? That's just a a strange thing. 
Uh, on this, it says, for this particular matter, the regents could say we want to act and therefore we do not want the UC president or the campus chancellors to act in this area and simply assert that, Robinson said. Another key exchange came moments later when Perez, the former speaker of the California State Assembly and a Cal graduate, asked Robinson about the mechanism required for withdrawing authority from a campus chancellor on matters of conference affiliation. Now, this is... It says, without noticing a meeting, without going to a meeting, between meetings, the board chair and the vice chair could act under interim action to retain an authority that had otherwise been delegated, and Robinson said that is correct. Now, it goes back and forth about policy changes, etc., but it all looks as the the regents could overturn this decision. Like, they, they really could go to UCLA and force them to remain in the Pac-12, and Another option would be to let them go to the Big Ten, but part of their payment from the Big Ten would have to go and subsidize Cal. That's a massive, massive deal. Like, if UCLA, I I guess for UCLA, you would have to look and see what the better option would be. All the travel, everything involved with the Big Ten, do you go and do that and have a large chunk of your payments taken out to go back to Cal? What do the other Pac-12 teams think about Cal getting subsidized, but nobody else? I mean, it's it's just a, this is a huge deal. Nobody really seems to be paying attention to it, but it is something to really, really pay attention to because that's that's going to change how this media rights deal ends up working out, what ends up happening to the Pac-12, expansion for other conferences, etc. This is a massive Massive situation. So I want to know what ends up happening here, uh, and I'm sure that you do as well, for sure. Moving on from there, Kentucky coach Mark Stoops has been on, uh, let's just say he's been on one. How's that? That's the best way to put that, right? He's been on one lately. Everybody knows about the John Calipari stuff, etc. And now the latest situation that we've got includes good old Mark Stoops talking about changing the climate versus the culture, and then he throws some shade at Shane Beamer, right? Now, this is from an interview that was recorded at SEC Media Days back in July that just now found the light of day. It says, uh, it's by Keith Farner here. Mark Stoops has done the remarkable at Kentucky by changing the program from an also-ran to one that can be a dark horse in the SEC East, fueled by multiple 10-win seasons. And he says, Stoops pointed out that the program has changed to the point that coaches around the league have noticed. Now, here is the quote. I think ultimately it's the respect throughout the league, Stoops said. It's the respect throughout the league when you're dealing with coaches and players. Win or lose, you walk out, you know you're going to be in a physical matchup. That we're coming to play, we're coming to compete, and having that mindset because that's not easy to change. And then he goes, it's easy to change the climate. You just change a uniform, talk a little game, dance around, put on some stupid sunglasses, you can change the climate, Stoop said. But to change a culture is at the core, and I'm quite certain we have changed our culture. Just who we are and how we're perceived. Walk around with some of the greatest coaches and that respect you get and the respect our players carry with them. And it says, that comment appeared to be directed towards South Carolina coach Shane Beamer, who took part in a viral video during SEC Media Days where he put on sunglasses during what was made to look like a music video. This is really, really interesting because normally when a coach goes off talking like this and he goes a little crazy, that means that he thinks he's got a squad that year or he's just tired of all the mess, right? Eventually, some coaches do just get tired and they start talking crazy. It sounds like Mark Stoops, with everything that he said back at John Calipari, who is the Kentucky men's basketball coach, and now what he's throwing over at Shane Beamer, who has one of the more hyped teams in that division, I wonder if Kentucky's got him a squad. I picked him to go 7-5. and five. I might have been way, way off on this because it sounds like he thinks that they are going to be awesome this year. Everybody's high on Will Levis. I get that. You look at the numbers from last year, eh. I might not have been so into it, but regardless, this is going to be interesting to see what they come out and do. I mean, they have got Florida in week two. That's going to be a huge game. I want to see what happens here. I don't necessarily like coaches calling out other coaches, you know, stupid sunglasses, whatever, but it does 
bring a lot of entertainment value, for sure. We we had Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher back in May, and now we got Stoops and Shane Beamer. Look, this Kentucky South Carolina matchup is on October eighth, the same day that Jimbo heads to Tuscaloosa. I cannot wait for this. I think this is going to be beautiful. So I want to see what happens. I, I want to hear if Shane Beamer decides to clap back. Uh, all kinds of things. I don't know what he could really say to Mark Stoops, uh, but it is quite apparent that Shane Beamer has done some really good things in just a, a short time in Columbia, South Carolina. So these are two coaches that are pretty well respected. A lot of people seem to believe in their uh, their foundation building. I will say that. And we'll see what happens. But I think this is going to be great. October 8th cannot get here fast enough Let's talk about some other stuff on the other side. Let's check out some things you should know about. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit betustv.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show, and from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right. John Canzano reported on this yesterday, and it was something that was brought up back in November. It's been something that's been talked about for years at this point, and that is the haze that you see on Pac-12 games on ESPN. Now, I'll bring up the article. This is in the Bald-Faced Truth by John Canzano over at johncanzano.com. Another one of these guys, along with Wilner, that knows everything that there is to know about the Pac-12. Uh, but he brings this up. He says, ESPN says it has fixed the problem with their Pac-12 broadcasts. Now, over the years, it says uh, ESPN hated me college, or last college football season. And they did because they really took offense to Canzano saying that ESPN was going with low-budget quality <laughs> on their Pac-12 broadcasts. Uh, the network was unhappy after I criticized it for airing a series of fuzzy, low-budget-looking Pac-12 conference games. Uh, it wasn't your TV. It wasn't your eyes or your cable connection. He said, I'm here to advocate for you, the Pac-12 football fans. I wrote a couple of columns on the subject after noting the puzzling low-definition early 1990s quality broadcast for the Washington State versus Oregon game that aired on November 13th. Now, it says, I learned that ESPN had the minimum number of cameras, six at the game. Also, staff and contractors who worked that game told me the network sent a substandard production truck to the event, used a backup spotter, and didn't have a stage manager present. Now, it says uh, it appeared to be cost-cutting by the network, etc., etc. Now, you go back and look. You can see pictures from this. Uh, that is the Stanford in Oregon game. And then Timothy Burke, uh, at Bubba Prague on Twitter, he went ahead and took pictures of the same field, just different broadcasts, right? On this one, you've got... Washington State and Oregon. This one is on the Pac-12 network. And then on this one, you have Fox showing a Pac-12 game. This is Washington State and Oregon. Then you have ESPN, where you can clearly see that it's a bit hazy. And then you have Oregon and Washington State again. This one on, it looks like ESPN News. Um, but just different different cameras, same field, etc., and, uh, and Timothy Burke said, same teams, same stadium. The march of technological progress is going backwards. This is interesting to me because uh, basically ESPN says, yo, we figured it out. We know what was up. It was the trucks. There was some bad connections, et cetera. Um, he said that they're working. He said, uh, it's the truck. That truck is from the 20th century. Now... <laughs> Uh, Kenzano went on a mission, tracked the rig down. It's owned by CSP Mobile Productions. Uh, it's a production company based in Maine. And ESPN and a, a lot of others contract work with them. And ESPN confirmed it has removed the truck from their rotation. So we will not get any more fuzzy, hazy, 
Pac-12 football games this season. And I think that's a step in the right direction. I, I certainly do. Hopefully you do as well. But, man, you want to talk about crazy for a little bit. Uh, last year, it, it was me trying to figure out why does this look so... CBS Sports Network had better quality than some of those games. And yet, here we are. Here we are. Moving on, Ross Dellinger from Sports Illustrated tweeted something very interesting yesterday. And I figured it was something that was going to stir up a, a big-time Twitter firestorm. And it did for a little bit. Not quite the size that I originally anticipated. But alas... Here we are, uh, the Big Ten media right stuff coming out, etc. There's there's a lot to talk about, and we've got games coming up in what eight days? Uh, no, no, I guess nine days. Whatever it is, the, today's Thursday. Games next Saturday. So, yes, I understand why it may not have, but we'll look at this. He said good stuff from T.J. Altimore, who analyzed fan base size in FBS based on several studies. T.J. By the way, strategy consultant. Um, he went to USC. He's he's done a lot, right? And this is a really interesting set of data that he has got. And eh, the way I've got it set up, it's not going to be able to pull up, right? Regardless. All right. He brings up 92% of all college football fans are fans of P5 programs. Now, that is interesting to me, first off, because I really thought that a lot of these lower lower programs – had quite a quite a few fans. Uh, now, all of this data, by the way, is built. I'm curious if I can open this in a different tab. We'll see. And that might help a little bit. Um, it says that this includes inbound conference teams only, excluding some newly promoted FCS teams lacking prior data. The source is the New York Times and uh, NYT 538 studies of fan bases in 2011 and 2014 and of vivid seat ticket sales data in 2014, normalized with 2020 U.S. Census data and Google Trends data, and multiple studies of overall national college football fan support. Inputs from each study are averaged based on number of inputs to avoid penalizing uh, teams not included in all three studies. Uh, this is from Altimore Collins and Company. Now, this is the interesting part. Uh, it says 50% of fans cheer for one of the top 16 teams, and we'll get to that here in a minute. 75% of fans cheer for one of the top 35 teams. 90% of fans cheer for one of the top 61 teams, which is where that 92% uh, of fans cheer for the 69 A5 Power Conference teams, which I don't think it's 69, but regardless, we will get there. Uh, he brings up this very interesting thing here. The top 16 teams account for 50% of all college football fans. And it goes from Ohio State as the biggest fan base in the country at 11.26 million. Notre Dame second with 8.21. Texas is third, 7.82. Penn State, 6.36. And then you've got da -da -da, Michigan, 6.26. Florida after that. Oregon after that. Alabama at 5.34 million. Wisconsin, 4.57. USC, 4.46. And then the rest of the top 16 is LSU, Georgia, Texas A&M. You'll get a kick out of this one. Syracuse at 3.45 million. Auburn and Tennessee, both with 3.27 million. Now, it takes all those together. The SEC has the biggest here. Five, or excuse me, 54.1 million. Next to the Big Ten at 44.6 the ACC, 31.7, and that includes Notre Dame in there. The Pac-12 at 23.5, and then the Big 12 is 11.6. It shows the Big 12 alignment here, or the realignment revolution. And all the teams that they lost from 2010, or the ones that they gained and lost from 2010 through 2020, they lost Nebraska, lost Colorado, lost Texas A&M, lost Missouri. Then you gain West Virginia, you gain TCU, so you went from 2010 at 27.32 million down to 19.94 million. And then you lose Texas A&M, you lose, excuse me, you lose Texas, you lose Oklahoma, and you gain BYU, UCF, Houston, and Cincinnati. You go from 19.94 million college football fans to 11.57 million. So in yeah, 15 years, you have dropped 58% 
of your overall fan base for that conference. That is not good. Uh, 58% decline is, is tough. I mean, it's just tough. This is an incredibly interesting read. There are plenty of articles out there about it, but, you know, Tony doing this, uh, Tony Altimore, TJ, uh, really interesting stuff that he's got. So I, I would highly recommend going and checking out his stuff along with Ross Dellinger. So uh, Ross has, I don't know how I'm not, I know what's going on here. Never mind. Uh, regardless, I'm logged into Winning Cures, everything right now. <laughs> That's what's happening. So really interesting stuff about fan base size. I don't know that I necessarily believe it, right? Syracuse has like the number 14 overall total fan base. Syracuse fans, hit me up. Tell me what you think about this, because that don't sound right. I, I, I've seen the Carrier Dome, or whatever it's called now, but I don't think they've got that many fans. Maybe I'm nuts. You guys tell me. I don't know. Oh, Notre Dame. Of course, their NBC deal right now, currently worth about $25 million. Everybody has talked about whether or not it makes a financial sense, or if they could even get away with staying independent right now based on what the Big Ten is doing with their current media rights deal and, of course, what the SEC has done. We have two Power Five conferences. We'll just call them the Super Two, whatever it is, the Power Two, because that's all we've got right now. It's two conferences that really are making up the bulk of this. Uh, But it appears, you know, we talked about Notre Dame asking for $75 million in their next media rights deal. Front Office Sports is reporting. Notre Dame's next media deal expected to fetch $60 million annually. Now, that makes sense. They are they have always been willing to take a bit of a pay cut just so that they can stay independent and do what they want to do. And I totally understand which direction that they're going. It says uh, the school's current deal worth $25 million per year. Uh, outlets reported in July Notre Dame was seeking $75 million. And, you know, it, it drew some speculation because... They are the only thing that was on NBC for the longest time. There was no shoulder programming. But NBC got them a lifeline with this Big Ten deal. And so long as there is shoulder programming, those Notre Dame ratings will skyrocket. I am convinced here. Uh, It says here, a report from November 2021 revealed viewership for Notre Dame's football games was down 48% year over year with an average of 2.5 million viewers. Now, let me... Let me go ahead and tell everybody, 2.5 million viewers in college football terms is gold, especially when you realize that when they face face off against uh, Clemson or USC or Stanford or any other number of big-time teams, right, big brands, that number skyrockets. They have, really, Notre Dame has kept the ACC in business. Because their non-conference deal, where they play five games per season against ACC competition, has really made that ACC deal worth what it is. Now, it says, uh, in 2020, Notre Dame produced the most viewers since 2005, but in 2019, viewership hit a record low for NBC with 2.1 million viewers. That's because the home slate in 2019 was pretty much garbage. Uh, And that's all that NBC has the rights to is Notre Dame's home games. Sports Business Journal reported the $60 million figure, noted the landscape could change when NBC's current deal is up in 2025. Notre Dame had no matchups against Power 5 teams ranked in the AP Top 25 for the 2021 football season, but a new deal with NBC could mean the Fighting Irish would face Big Ten teams more often. Um, Now, it it does have, this was before the Big Ten rights were agreed to, etc., or at least announced. Um, This is going to be interesting. Because now that you've got that shoulder programming for Notre Dame, I expect those viewers to jump through the roof. I think it's going to be huge for them because you go immediately from a Notre Dame game into a Big Ten game on Saturday night. You don't have to leave the channel if you're a Big Ten fan. You can just watch the Notre Dame game, which will always be considered a big-time game, and you jump right into whatever the Saturday night game is for that conference. I think it's, uh, I think it's smart. I think it's good, and I think that this allows Notre Dame to stay independent. A $60 million deal, probably for the lifetime of, it, it, let's say, if it starts in 2025. Is that right? i got to double-check this. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Oh, NBC's deal is up in 2025. So, probably going to go a little further than the Big Ten rights, but 
We'll figure that out when we get there. <laughs> Since the Big Ten rights start in, uh, they might sound like a five-year deal then. Uh, the Big Ten rights is uh, is seven years, and I guess that'd be four years. Regardless, regardless, uh, what we're looking at here is Notre Dame being able to stay independent for quite some time because their deal is up just at the same time that the college football playoff contract is up with ESPN, and you know that the CFP, you heard Bob Thompson on the show with me last week, you know that that CFP deal is going to be massive because you now have NBC wanting to get involved, CBS, ESPN, Fox, and the streamers. You have people that really want a piece of the college football postseason, and they are going to pay a pretty penny for it. They really are. It's going to be a massive, massive deal, especially if they decide to expand, which I would almost guarantee. I mean, we're talking 99.99% that that thing will expand. All right, let's hit a couple more, and then we've got a a few interesting things to hit on the backside, including uh, best streaming platforms to watch college football on this year. I dug into a little bit. Hope you're going to like it. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures. And you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right. Now, I led off with this, or not led, I teased this. The best streaming platforms to watch college football in the 2022 season. Now, I have been a cord cutter for a long time now. Long time. And I have continuously used YouTube TV, even with all of the price hikes, etc. I've got YouTube TV and ESPN+. Plus. That works for me. I don't have to worry too much about the Pac-12 network games, etc. I've got plenty of games to watch already right now. So... Let's dive into this. Uh, I want to bring it up on the screen here for those that are watching on YouTube. But you look at this, and of course, your local networks, CBS, NBC, Fox, and ABC, all have different games on. So YouTube TV has all four of those. Hulu, Fubo, and DTV Stream, whatever that ends up being. Uh, This article, by the way, over at thestreamable.com, you can search for it. Very easy to find uh, how to watch college football streaming, etc. Now, YouTube TV has all those, and they're only $64.99. Hulu, $69.99. How to watch college football on cable sports networks. Now, this one, a little, uh, little interesting, a little tricky. ESPN, ESPN2, FS1, FS2, <laughs> interesting, TBS, TNT, and USA Network. Now, I don't know how many games are going to be on TBS or TNT. I do know that USA, every now and then, has to air uh, the NBC Games for Notre Dame, etc. If something big is going on on regular NBC. So that is something to keep in mind for this. Uh, but the ones that have all of those channels, Hulu and YouTube. Sling uh, allows it if you jump into like different tiers, etc. Uh, or you can pay more for like FS2. Uh, that certainly is, is worth looking at. Sling TV is doing a better job of digging into, into these things. Um, but yeah. Uh, Fubo TV does not have TBS or TNT, um, but yeah, the DTV stream is that, that that's Direct TV, by the way. Uh, but theirs is really expensive, so we shall see. Along with that, then you get into all of the different uh, college sports channels, right? This is where it gets really tricky. Direct TV obviously had all of those regular channels just fine, so Direct TV streaming. Absolutely. Fubo TV has a few here and there. Uh, but once you get into this, ACC Network, ACC Network Extra, the Big Ten Network, CBS Sports Network, ESPNU, the Longhorn Network, Pac-12 Network, and the SEC Network. 
YouTube has all but the Longhorn Network and the Pac-12 Network. Hulu is the exact same way. Hulu Live, whatever it is. Sling TV requires an upgrade. And then like another upgrade on top of that. So it's a continual upgrades to get up to where you are paying basically the same as you would with YouTube TV or with Hulu. Um, and then you've got your streaming only channels. YouTube TV does have ESPN3. Uh, they don't have Stadium. They don't have BN Sports. Now, at Stadium, you can also get on like Pluto, stuff like that, Pluto TV. Those are free. You just go download the Pluto TV app, and then it's fine. Uh, Fubo has ESPN3, Next Level Sports, and BN. You're not going to be looking for a ton of games if you are a if you are one of the 92 percent of college football fans that want to watch the P5 games, then this is going to be perfect for you. My recommendation here is YouTube TV. Uh, now that is because I've got deals worked out elsewhere. Now, if you have children, uh, you have a wife, etc. The Hulu Live thing might be better because you can get a package of Hulu Live to go along with ESPN Plus and to go along with, um, what is it? Oh, Disney Plus, right? So Disney, ESPN Plus, and Hulu Live. They're all cheaper if you package them together. So if that's something that you're interested in, that's absolutely fine. But the best option for me has been YouTube TV. I've not had to worry about anything over the last, I've had it since 2019. So four years now, and everything's great. You just pay it monthly. It's 65 bucks. Very easy. And, uh, and, you know, I trust them. I'll say that. So I trust them to have the games that I want and to give me the access on those. That is the biggest thing for me. We'll move on from there. Congratulations are in order for Scott Strickland and the University of Florida Athletic Program because they got their new football facility opened up, and it looks fantastic. I'm going to pull up the video here and let you guys see it, but uh, we'll turn it down just a touch. How's that? But you can see it here. This is uh, Carlos Pineda, who did like a little 40-second clip. But it is awesome looking. Um, it says it's an $85 million facility. It broke ground in June of 2020. It is uh, the site of the old Alfred A. McKethan Stadium. Um which was the former home of the baseball team before they moved into the new Florida ballpark before the 2021 season. Uh, this is located next to the Stephen O'Connell Center. But it is. I'm telling you, man, this thing looks so good. I mean, just so good. I'm, I'm so impressed with what they did here. Uh, just massive, massive stuff. Looking at the numbers, looking at what all they've got. It's next to the basketball arena, right? The Stephen O'Connell Center. Uh, the new training center will be considered to be one of the best in the country, including brand new weight rooms, locker rooms, a rehab facility uh, with hydrotherapy, a cabana-style pool, a recording studio, barbershop, and much more. And it says, while the football team and its staff will be housed in the new facility, it will also be open to all University of Florida student-athletes with a new dining hall and lounge with the aim of connecting student-athletes across all sports. Scott Strickland, it, now this was approved while Dan Mullen was still the coach. But this is part of the reason why Dan Mullen is no longer the coach. Because they are willing to put in whatever they have to do to be successful as a football program. And I think that's why Billy Napier is there. And this is huge, huge for them. Uh, it was called Game Changing. Like, this is a game changer for that program. And I think it is. Urban Meyer used to complain about the fact that their facilities were not exactly up to date. I mean, that was, what, 12 years ago. When he was complaining about that, so yeah, this is uh, this is something big heading into recruiting, etc. They open this up before the season. Obviously, big things coming up now. This won't make as big of a deal as NIL, but you still have to keep up with the Joneses. You can't just let everything fall back to the wayside. Now, Kentucky's basketball coach probably looking at this as well, going, "What in the world is going on?" But regardless, uh, this thing looks awesome. I, I did read something really cool about one of their training rooms. They can project a like they can project film on it, and then the players can line up in anticipation of what's going to happen from the lineup from the other team. Like they've got a football field on the ground, and they can line up against it. Like that is really awesome stuff. So, 
groundbreaking stuff, game-changing stuff for the University of Florida. Congratulations, Scott Strickland. That is a massive, massive deal. Congratulations are also in order for Malachi Nelson, who is set to be the first high school athlete signed by Clutch, uh, Clutch Sports, which is Rich Paul and LeBron James's agency. Now, Malachi Nelson is the top-rated football player in the 2023 class, at least according to ESPN. He's number two basically everywhere else behind Arch Manning. But this is a a pretty big deal. It, on three's rankings, I don't know how much I trust on three's rankings, uh, but he says or it says that he has an NIL valuation of $738,000 a year. I think Malachi Nelson, he is a USC commit. I think going to USC and being a superstar for Lincoln Riley is worth well more than seven hundred and something thousand dollars, right? Maybe I'm crazy. You guys can let me know in the comments. But this is a huge, huge deal. Um, he did visit Texas A&M recently, <laughs> and of course, there is. A, I'm not scared to talk about rumors on here. There are rumors going around that apparently he was offered fifteen million dollars to sign with Texas A&M. We'll see what kind of truth there is to that, but uh, just nuts. Just nuts. He is signing, and it appears that Clutch thinks that he is going to be worth quite a bit. Um, it says it's a further foray into the NIL world for the agency founded by Rich Paul and LeBron James. Clutch signed then-USC quarterback Keaton Slovis in the immediate uh, immediate months following NIL legislation, and in a conversation with front office sports back in February, executive Jade Lee English emphasized that the agency is doing its best to be a resource for college and high school athletes in the space. This is a pretty big deal. This is a pretty big deal. And so we'll see what ends up happening. I want to know about this $15 million deal at Texas A&M. You know, if we heard Jimbo talk about Connor Wigman being the best quarterback in the world and, you know, we think we got the best one here, et cetera, et cetera. Eh, what ends up happening there if uh, if they end up taking Malachi Nelson? Eh, interesting stuff. But, yeah, this is big for him. This is big for USC. This is big for Clutch. I mean, all this. So I, I can't wait to see what ends up happening with Malachi Nelson, for sure. We'll close out on this one. I always like bringing up other media companies that are doing really well. I've talked about Pat McAfee multiple times. But this is a whole different deal. Whole different deal. Penn Entertainment, which at one point was Penn Gaming, Penn purchases the remainder of Barstool Sports for $387 million. Now, of course, it shows Dave Portnoy on here. Uh, it says he founded Barstool Sports in 2003. But they were already a large, large stakeholder in the company, right? The company initially purchased 36% of the website in 2020 for $163 million in a deal that combined sports gambling and online media. The deal stipulated that Penn could buy the remaining shares via a two-step process for $387 million. Formerly known as Penn National Gaming, Launched the sportsbook app with the Barstool and claims to have reached a younger audience. In February 2021, Penn revealed it gained over 72,000 registered customers in Pennsylvania following the launch of the app, which generated nearly $300 million. 72,000 registered customers generated $300 million? I don't know why I didn't think about that earlier. That is, uh, that's interesting. I've got to look at the numbers now. And I'm going to do this on the air, and I know it's not great radio, but... We got to we got to look at these things. Three hundred million dollars divided by seventy two thousand. That is uh, over almost forty two hundred dollars per person that signed up on that sportsbook app. That is nuts. That's the average. All right. Anyway, uh, yes, Barstool absolutely is worth a lot. Um, it says a year ago the company purchased the Score, a Canadian based digital media company. For two billion dollars, the fact that they were able to purchase Barstool for three hundred eighty-seven million, uh, which you know, we'll say half a billion dollars when you include the one sixty-three from before that, this seems like a bargain, like an absolute bargain to me, because they reach between all of their different shows, etc. That platform reaches so many people, and they finally figured out a way to monetize it using sports books other than just using merch sales, which they were already fantastic at doing that. 
They did ad sales. They did merch sales. And now they are able to do it with a sports book. And it is genius. Those guys are great at what they do. They stir up controversy. They can stir up controversy within their own office and talk about it. And people are interested in it because they know all of the different personalities. I don't have that luxury because I am, in fact, a one-man show. But it is something to think about. Might be worth bringing in somebody just to do something like that. Uh, Regardless, I ain't all that worried about it. Ain't all that worried about it. All right, uh, let me go on and say this. Uh, Rest in peace to Luke Knox, former Ole Miss player, was a a Florida international player. Mike McIntyre announced the news this morning that he uh, passed away suddenly. Uh, He's the brother of Dawson Knox, of course, tight end for the Buffalo Bills. Just, you hate seeing anything like this. Uh, There's no time that's a good time for that. So, I did want to end on a bit of a somber note, but yeah, Luke Knox, uh, don't know the cause of death right now, but you hate to see that. Uh, guy had a lot of life left to go, and uh, and that's a painful one. That really is. All right, we are going to go ahead and get out of here. You guys have been fantastic. I do have big announcements next week, so make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Make sure that you share out the show, etc. Love to hear your comments. Jump into the chat. Jump into the comments as well, and, uh, and hit me up on Twitter, at GaryWCE. With that said, we are going to dive out of here. Again, you guys are awesome. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.